All right, well, good morning. Pastor Chris gave me an assignment uh, for today, and that's kind of to set the cultural, theological background context for the book of Esther. So go ahead and turn to Esther. We're not going to look at it. That's going to be Pastor Chris's job over the next few weeks. But my job is to kind of help us figure out where we're at in the history and what's going on and what's the backdrop for this uh, very important book. And so we, we look forward to it. Now, one of the things that's interesting about the book of Esther is that we read these pages and we know God is involved, but as we'll talk about in just a moment, he's not mentioned. It, it's almost like he's in secret or behind the scenes. He's silent in this book. Now, just a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to preach to you and uh, I talked to you about my frustration with puzzle. And uh, so many of you were kind enough to hear my, my, my soul on that and how devastating it was to not be able to complete that puzzle. And several of you silently, without really naming your names or letting me know, um, have provided me with several puzzles that uh, are, are, some of them are designed for ages two to four to kind of <laughs> rebuild that confidence. Somebody else actually made a puzzle that was uh, specifically for me and about preaching the word of God. And so far, that's the only puzzle I put together. And uh, Mr. Chatakowski over here, he uh, actually sent me one through Amazon. And I, Shelly walks into my office. She goes, your Amazon order came today. And I go, what Amazon order? No, I don't know. It's got, I said, I didn't order anything from Amazon. And sure enough, I open it up and there's some puzzles for me to rebuild my confidence. All along, and several of them I, I got, I don't know who sent them. All, right, all they did was show up in my office secretly, silently. Somebody is tormenting me as I made myself so vulnerable before you just a few weeks ago. And so, you know, I appreciate the, the, the sincerity <laughs> and I, you know, it's nice to know that you're listening to the illustrations. Hopefully you listen to the preaching and teaching portion as well. But that's how I like to think of the book of Esther. God at work, things are happening. You don't necessarily know why they're happening or how they're happening, but they're happening nonetheless. And so we come to this book with that understanding. And so I put a title on this passage or this message, The Silent Work of Sovereignty, because I think that's what's really going on. And so as we begin to approach this book, um, as I said, I have the task of setting the cultural and theological context for it. And this book hasn't always been accepted as part of the Bible. As a matter of fact, Martin Luther is quoted as saying that he is an enemy to the book of Esther. He hated the book of Esther. And uh, he, he, he said this, he said, namely because of too many heathen unnaturalities. Well, that's really old English stuff there going on. Basically what he's saying is there's a lot of evil stuff going on in this book. Now, we have tried to redeem some of these things by uh, viewing it in different ways and different interpretations. But nonetheless, Here's the thing that you have to come to grips with when you, we, we approach the book of, of Esther. As you look at all the different things that are going on and, and, and the practices that are very, very questionable, you, you need to couple this with the fact that the Persian king is mentioned 190 times in this book of only 167 verses. 190 times the king of Persia's mission. God is not mentioned once. And so that's kind of like the elephant in the room, so to speak. Why, why was this book included? This is why people like Martin Luther question it. But what you, what you understand is that even though God's not directly mentioned at all, it, it's, it, and it's understandable how somebody might want to be opposed to it, 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 it fails to understand that these objections really don't take into account the context of God's plan for his people from whom which will come a Savior. See, God promised Abraham all the way back in, in Genesis chapter 12 that he was going to build a nation from him, and he was going to bless all nations through that nation. And Israel's history is unique in many ways because there is really no reason, humanly speaking, 
for Israel to exist today. All the things that have happened to this little bitty country, it's amazing that it still is in existence today. And so as we get to the book of Ezra, it is this point in the story of God's people, the Babylonian kingdom that had taken them captive is gone. It's been overtaken, overthrown by the Persian kingdom, who God said, I'm going to raise them up. And as we study some of the Old Testament prophets, God says, hey, I'm going to do something really neat, really unique. I'm going to raise up another pagan king. And the people of Israel are going like, what? How can you do, how does this fit into your plan? Well, Esther kind of helps us understand how it fits into the plan. You see, the, the Babylonian kingdom had a, had a strategy. When it went in and conquered the land, it took the biggest and brightest young people back to the homeland. Remember the book of Daniel? Daniel was one of those biggest and brightest young people, and he was brought back to the nation of Babylon. And there he was able to, uh, to be used of God in some great ways. And that's what the whole book of Daniel is all about. That was the Babylonian strategy. The Persian strategy was totally different. They wanted nothing to do with bringing people back, having to support them as uh, foreign immigrants or slaves or whatever. They, they had no desire whatsoever to keep them. So here they are, they take over Babylon, the Babylonian kingdom, and now they got all these Jewish people who are living in the land that they have to take care of. They have no desire. That's not their strategy. So it's during the Persian kingdom that the three, three returns, they're talking about in Nehemiah and Ezra, the re, three returns of bunches of Jewish people going back to the land. Nehemiah talks about building the wall to strengthen it, to protect them from outside sources that might come in and try to, try to pillage them. Ezra talks about the building of the temple and, and how that went about to deal with the spiritual vitality of the nation. And so and during these three returns, shared with us in Nehemiah and Ezra, we learn about how this people that had been brought out of, of Israel, taken to Babylon, stayed there for 70 years as God prophesied they would. Then you have this geopolitical shift of powers that takes place right at the very moment the 70 years comes to conclusion. And God sends his people back. And so there we have the beautiful demonstration of God and his sovereignty working in the midst of all the normal, everyday geopolitical. The world powers had no idea what was going on. The Persian king could care less about what's going on in Babylon. He just wanted Babylon. And so we have to recognize that God is at work and but here's an interesting problem that we come to when we come to the book of Esther. Esther does not go back in any of the returns. Esther, as we study her and her uncle Haman, they are Jews living in the land that had settled in and they stayed there. And Esther, she was in the king's court or his harem to be a wife to the Persian king. And no one knew she was a Jew. So at best, she was minimal in her relationship with the God of Israel. At best. Now I know I might be stepping into some controversy because some have written books that talk about godly Esther and all those kinds of things. There's no doubt that Esther demonstrates courage in this book. And there is no doubt that God used her but that doesn't mean we have to elevate her above what we see in the text. The fact that she would become a, married to a foreign king was a violation of the law. Not being able to be known as a Jew was a violation of the law that she was supposed to live under. We look at Daniel. Daniel was actually going through hardship because of his stance against giving up his allegiance to following God's command. None of which is talked about with Esther. But all that aside, the fact of the matter is we see God working 
in this life. And even so, God's not directly mentioned. He's silent in this book. His fingerprints are all over it. And it demonstrates that God is always at work carrying out his plan even when he is silent and nothing can stop him. So this is the big idea that I want us to understand. God is always working his plan, always working his plan, regardless of the geopolitical chaos or the, even the unfaithfulness of his people. God is working his plan. And we're going to see that come forth in our study of the book of Esther. And so as we prepare for this study that we're going to go through, this morning, I want to explore three things. The silent work of God's sovereignty, as we see in the rest of Scripture, this is not abnormal. And the mess of humanity, this time period in Jewish his, Jews' history, it shows and demonstrates the mess of humanity. But then the beauty of God's plans and His purposes. So let's pray and ask God's blessing as we look into His Word this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. We recognize that there's so much more that we could explore or even say today. But may through your spirit you enlighten our minds. May we be able to understand the backdrop from which the book that we are going to study comes. And, and to be able to see your handiwork in all of it. And may it give us encouragement and faith and the ability to trust you when you seem to be silent in our lives. God, use this time in your, for your glory, for your purposes. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Now what I want to do this morning in the time that I have, uh, which isn't a lot, but it's enough, okay? You've heard me enough over the last 20-something years, so. But what I wanted to do is just kind of briefly run through the Old Testament in particular and just tell us and, and see these examples of God's silence and yet sovereign workings in those situations. You'll recall that it wasn't but just a few months ago now, maybe, or I don't know how many months ago, where Pastor Chris was going through the life of Joseph, which is account, account, accounted for us in, in uh, Genesis 37 through 50, in Joseph's life. And we were introduced to Joseph at the age of 17 in Genesis chapter 37. And what we see is that God is silent. He does not directly speak during this time, during this story, but it is clear that God is work. We, at work. We hear that God is with him, but as far as Joseph is concerned, as he goes from being the one with the coat of many colors and being the favored son to being sold and, and to slavery and finding himself in a pit and then being in Potiphar's house and being run out of that and then run into uh, Egypt and, and, and being put into a, a prison there and being forgotten over and over and over again. We see God at work. We see God's presence. But as far as Jacob or Joseph is concerned, he is silent. Can you imagine going through all that he went through and not necessarily directly hearing from God? Can you imagine praying and asking and, and having people say, hey, please, when you get out of prison, can you remember me? And to just be forgotten. Can you imagine the amount of time that went by and still Joseph held on to his God, even when God was silent? But when we study these passages, we can't help but see the silent work of God's sovereignty. I also remind you of Moses and Israel. Moses and Israel, and so after the time of Joseph, when Joseph had the opportunity to become the number three man in the land, and God used him greatly to provide for the Egyptians, and then also to provide for God's people during a time of great famine, world famine, God was able to use Joseph to do that. But then Joseph dies, the king dies, and all of that is forgotten. And we see the picture when we get towards the time of Moses where things are getting rougher and rougher and rougher for the children of Israel. They are being treated more and more like slaves and life is getting to be even more and more difficult. One of the interesting things is that God's not speaking directly to his people during this time. They cry out to him. They ask for a deliverer, but it takes 80 years for that deliverer to get there. Now, how many of you are 80 years old here today? 
Just go ahead, raise your hands proud you've made it this far. Now, just look around. Keep those hands up. I know it's hard at 80 years old to keep your hand up that long. <laughs> but I see about three or four people in a congregation of this size. Oh, then we got another one there. So we have five. Five people in a congregation this size. Reach 80. That means that Carl and Linda and Jackie over here, I can't remember your name, but nonetheless, they're the only ones here that would have remembered this cry that originally came out when the oppressed people of the Jewish nation cried out, God, send a deliverer. 80 years has taken place and nothing. But what we need to understand is that in the time that we see this where they cry out, we are told the story of a baby being born. And miraculously, that baby ends up getting raised in Pharaoh's home. But then in 40 years, he's a grown man. He comes out and he tries to do this deliverance thing all on his own. And it was a disaster. So then he goes on the backside of the desert for 40 years. And then God comes to him and says, okay, now Moses, it's time. 80 years from the time that God, the people of God cried out for him, deliver us, Moses comes. But all of it, when we study it, God is at work. They are being abused. Things are getting worse. They cry out to God, but God raises a deliverer, and it takes 80 years for it to come. God was virtually silent during this time, but he was at work. Another example, the example of the Babylonian captivity, which borders on to our time in Esther. The warning was given in Deuteronomy chapter 28. If you obey me, I will bless you in the land. If you disobey me, I will remove you from the land. They tested God over and over and over again. The book of Judges talks about this cycle of rebellion where they are in the land. They're experiencing the prosperity that God provides to them as they live obediently in the land. But then they begin to think, hey, it's all us and we can do whatever we want to. They begin to drift away from God. Eventually, they just forsake God. And then God brings in an oppressor, which is what he told them we would do. And they, they cry out to God. They repent. And God sends a judge and delivers them. But it's that same cycle over and over and over again. The prediction of captivity, that if you keep doing this, there's going to come a time where God's going to stop Delivering you, he's going to send you out of the land like he told you. And this prediction came in Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah tells him, hey, look, you're going to go to Babylon. Don't listen to all these false prophets that are telling you that's not going to happen. They're go you're going to Babylon. And guess what? You should settle down. You build your houses. Become a good citizen because you're going to be there a while. Seventy years. Now, imagine being a 15-year-old Daniel being taken to Babylon, and now at 85 years of age, that captivity is coming to an end. That's a long time to not hear directly from God. Now, Jeremiah is ministering to them. Daniel's ministering. But for the most part, God is silent. He says nothing to them. Daniel, one of the exiles, has to experience all the hardship. He was a godly young man, but he still had to experience it because the people had tested God and God fulfilled his warning, I will take you out of the land. It's in Daniel chapters 9 and 10 where we find that Daniel, studying the book of Jeremiah, realizes that the 70 years is almost over. And Daniel realizes he is never, the nation has never yet repented for their rebellion. And so I would encourage you, if you have time, go read Daniel chapter 9 and chapter 10, and you're going to see that Daniel cries out to God, and on behalf of the nation, he repents of their rebellion, all of which is in preparation for God to begin to send them back. Daniel's under the Babylonian king, but the soon coming Persian king, who's not going to care about the exile, and who's actually going to pay for them to go back and, and pay for them to build their temple and to build their walls is going to come about. It's an amazing time. And again, God is virtually 
silent, but clearly at work, using the natural events in humanity, using a nation like Persia who could care less about keeping immigrants in their land. No, just send them back. Give them some money to get set up and then let them take care of themselves. Here's what we glean from these examples of God's silence, but yet still actively at work. God works in the natural events of this world to accomplish his sovereign purposes. It's only sometimes when we look back, when we see what God perhaps was doing. I think of, when I think of this idea, I think of the five missionaries that went to um, minister in, in uh, where was it? My mind just went blank. Ecuador, yes. Um, went to Ecuador, and they lost their lives. It's an amazing story. And at first, when you look at that story, you go like, wow, what a waste. Young men wanting to serve God. Why would God allow that to happen? But I can tell you one of the reasons. It was through that event that God built up and raised up many, many missionaries to go to the mission field. My mother and father were one of the ones that were challenged by their testimony, and they wanted to go. They ended up with some, a surprise number three kid that came along and, and, and complicated things a little bit. But nonetheless, it was through that testimony the modern missionary movement really kind of flourished after that, where many people said, I'll step in. Now, you look back on that, when you're in the midst of it, you're going like, what in the world? Why, why, why would these cannibalistic, why would these people come and do that? Why would they do that? God knew what he was doing. He used their testimonies in some significant ways. The God is at work. Now, it's interesting when you study the time period which we are in, the, we, we, we get a picture, we kind of walk through it a little bit, but I want to highlight it, the mess of humanity. One of the things that the Old Testament does for us well, especially as we look at pre-exile, pre-captivity, and post-captivity, post-exile Jews, what went on? Pre-exile, there's clear evidence that they forgot God over and over and over again, walked away from him continuously. Over and over again they did this. It took extreme measures to get them to repent, like bringing an oppressor in and, and getting them to recognize that, hey, we were a lot better off when we had God at the center of our lives. And so it took this over and over again, but they didn't learn their lesson. And they began to walk continuously away from God in this cycle of prosperity in the land, forgetting God, oppression, repentance becomes the norm in the life of Israel. You study the kings, and there were good kings, and there were evil kings, but the evil kings outranked and outnumbered the good ones. But when we come to the post-exilic Israel or the post-captivity, after the Babylonian captivity, it's interesting because there were three stages. What God did in the exile is he built a passion, a drive to be in the land. What we still see to this day a drive to be in the land. What's missing is as a drive to be in a correct relationship with God. But there is a drive to be in the land, and they will protect that land ferociously. That's why we see the conflict going on today. It comes from this era where Esther and, and Ezra and Nehemiah come from. They've come out of the exile to Babylon. They had been removed from the land, and now at the very fiber of their bone. We want to be in the land, the land that God promised. And so when you see this conflict going on and you wonder, where's all that coming from? It's coming from this time period. And we have these three stages, as we've mentioned, of return. And, the, and their focus of attention is in Nehemiah and Ezra. And as I said, Nehemiah has emphasized the building of the wall, Ezra the temple. But the exile <laughs> produced this fixation upon the land, a focus that remains today. Now, there's one major difference when you study post-exile Israel and pre-exile Israel. One major difference, and that is this. 
in the post-exile, there is a readiness to repent. We saw stubbornness in pre-exile, but there's a readiness to repent because they don't want to be removed from the land, but there's still this struggle, this cycle of rebellion that comes over, and God continues to send them to prophets to warn them. But eventually, this struggle led to 400 years of silence from the ending of Malachi to the coming and the announcement of Jesus, the Savior. Even though in that 400 years, God was at work. And the book of Esther provides for us how God protected his people to get them into the land so that they would remain a people who would then eventually produce a Savior in Jesus Christ who would bring salvation to the world, which is the very promise that God made Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12. You see, the major difference is is that they struggle to have faithfulness. That's the messiness of humanity. Our culture... Clearly, clearly, there's been a major shift away from God. We see that evidence all around us. Now, we can focus in on that, and we can bemoan and cry, and we can do all the different things that, that uh, may be involved and just talk about, oh, I wish for the good old days. What we really need to understand is there really weren't that many good old days. Evil still prevailed. Our culture has been marching away from God for a long, long time. And we're in a long list of many other nations who have done the same. For example, we study the life of Paul. And we see all the places that he went to where he planted churches. And the early church was established. You know what we call that area now? The 1040 window. The least reached places of the world. And we've seen the gospel march all the way around the world. We saw it revived in England and Europe, and then it was brought over here. We're just a few years behind from Europe. And what we see happening in Europe is coming here. We should not be surprised. But God is still working and still bringing people into the kingdom, even here, even in Europe, but in the Latin world, he's alive and well. In places like China, he's alive and well. No matter what the news may tell you, there are people coming to know the Lord in Muslim countries, left and right. God is not limited by the geopolitical chaos, nor is he limited by the unfaithfulness of his people and his church. Because you see, we live in an area within a hundred, within a mile, 15 miles or so, there's over 100,000 people, the majority of which do not know Jesus Christ. What are we doing? We're no different than they were in Israel during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah and the time of Esther. We're just sitting there in our paneled houses of worship and our wonderful homes and our protected cities, and the rest of the world can go into hell in a basket and we don't care. Because we have forgotten that God has placed us here to be a light to the nations. Israel forgot that. We've forgotten that. The missionary movement in our country is waning because we've lost focus. But here's the hope. All the mess that we see around us. This is is the most beautiful truth. God is is not limited by our unfaithfulness. You see, humanity's inability to get themselves out of the mess is a clear indication of the need of a Savior. A need of a Savior. That's the message that we have for our world. See, because the beauty of God's plan, what we see in the book of Esther, is how God preserves a nation Even though his fingerprints are all over the book, his name is not mentioned. Even though Esther maybe minimally is a follower of God, but probably not, God uses her courage and her willingness to step into the place of uh, of being used by him 
to accomplish his purposes. The fact of the matter is, Esther is a reminder that God is not limited by our unfaithfulness. He is not limited by what's going on in the world. As a matter of fact, he is working silently behind the scenes to make sure his will, his purposes will become reality. See, Esther shows us how sovereignty saved his people from a annihilation. What we don't think about is that not only were the people that stayed back in underneath the Persian rulership, not only were they in danger, but the decree that was supposed to be passed would have had ramifications for all those who went back. The goal was to destroy all Israel from the planet of the earth. Now, have we not seen that happen in recent history? And are we not seeing some of those same sentiments rising up now? Answer, yes. Because Satan hates this nation. But Wester shows us it is through God's sovereignty that he saved his people from annihilation. And through his people, the Messiah, the Savior, comes who can rescue us from the mess. He solves the mess of humanity. And so what I want us to keep in mind as we approach this book, as Pastor Chris preaches our way through it, as tragic as humanity's track record is with their relationship with God, as tragic as it might be, it is comforting to know that God is always, and I say it again, always, pursuing his people and he has secured an, an eternal inheritance for all who put their faith and trust in him that's the reality God says to a lost and dying world trust me God says to his church trust me life seems to go in wacko trust me I don't see how we can get our way through this. Trust me. How in the world are you allowing all this to happen? Trust me. I'm going to fulfill my promises and I will accomplish my purposes regardless of what's going on around us. So hold on in faith and hope and trust because we serve a God who is worthy of our trust. And we don't really need any other example than we have right here in front of us. This is a constant reminder. So I'm going to ask the deacons if they'll come forward and help serve this communion. Because this communion table tells us something very, very important that we have seen as we've looked through this. God is always at work. Humanity is a mess. But Jesus came. Jesus came to clear the mess, to solve the mess. And he has given us his plan. And this is what this table is all about. In a moment, you're going to receive a cup that has both the bread and the juice. The bread represents the body of Jesus Christ. He became a man in order to take our place to solve humanity's problem. The juice reminds us of the blood of Jesus Christ, which was shed to, forgive, to give us forgiveness for sins. Today, we celebrate as one body this wonderful truth that God has given to us as a reminder, even if it is crazy, trust me, because I provided a way. If you don't know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior here today, then this table is really not for you. We're not trying to make you uncomfortable in any way, but just let the plate pass by. Because there are warnings in Scripture because this is for those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And we want you to be able to um, enjoy what we do here, but recognize that this is limited to those who are believers. If you're a believer and your life is not squared up with what the truth is, then it's time for confession making yourself right, preparing yourself. This is a constant reminder. Christ has forgiven everything. And he set us free from sin to live righteously before him. And this is a celebration of that freedom. This is a celebration of the opportunity that we have to live victorious 
and to love him. So bow with me in prayer as we get ready to serve these elements. Lord, thank you for your sovereign control in all these things. When talking about Christ, it says in the fullness of time. In other words, at the right time, you sent your son, Jesus Christ. You've always been in control. And you know the times and the times we may not know, but you're still in control. And when we look back, we can see your hand in all these things. Give us the faith to trust you in the here and now. And may these elements that we partake remind us that you loved us enough to send your son. And he gave us his life in order that we might experience it full and free salvation. And so we ask you to work in our hearts. Use this time for your glory in Christ's name. Amen.